Hello, so this DSLR dinosaur has got a Canon R5. Now, I've been shooting this for the last four or five months, shot many different assignments all across the UK and overseas, everything from portraits to landscapes and pretty much everything in between. And only now do I begin to feel like I've got enough experience and time with the camera to sort of consolidate my thoughts and present to you my, my thoughts so far on this camera. Now, it's not all good nor all bad, it's the yin and the yang. I like to present a, a balanced representation of my thoughts with these things. And, you know, I'm not so keen on videos where people, um, you know, just do an unboxing and then take a few pictures of some ducks in the park and then read the spec sheets and then profess to be an expert on the camera. I think these things take a long time. This is a complicated beast and um, you have to evolve with the camera and you have to learn. I'm still on that journey, so I welcome you to join me on my journey into the world of mirrorless. Um, thank you, by the way, for all of my new subscribers, and apologies for not making so much content lately. I've been really busy with assignment photography and travel and all kinds of other things. I've got lots of videos in the pipeline, and I really do appreciate all of the new subscriptions. And if you haven't yet, please do consider subscribing because it means the world to me. I'm trying to grow the channel from the smallest photography YouTube channel in the world to, to maybe the second or third smallest, who knows. Uh, but I do appreciate all of your support. So thank you very much. I'm not gonna talk about video today. It's just gonna be about photography. And I'm just gonna touch on each of the different elements of the camera and talk about my experiences so far, my thoughts so far. Feel free to jump in on the comments. If you've got some experience with this camera, it's always great to hear from everybody. If you don't know, I'm a British-based professional photographer, have been for about 30 years, shoot all kinds of different things from advertising to editorial and everything in between, a vast array of different types of photography. And I think that's really important to try out a camera like this on lots of different, different environments and lots of different real world shoots to battle test the gear before I kind of start to begin to talk about it. Now these things are subjective and these are just my opinions. So, you know, bear that in mind and do feel free to jump in on the comments, as I said, if you've got any thoughts about the camera. So hopefully there'll be something in here uh, that's of interest to anyone that has any kind of interest in the Canon R5. So here we go. Okay, so let's talk about why I bought this camera and the price and all of that kind of stuff. So Canon loaned me one of these about a year ago with a bunch of different lenses and I tried it out and I was impressed enough to know that when the time to invest in new camera equipment came around, that it would probably be one of these bodies that I bought. And that's what happened. Now, it was getting to a point where my previous camera, which was the Canon 5D Mark IV, was getting quite long in the tooth. And it still works fine. Everything is still fine about it. Apart from, I started to get that feeling that maybe it would be Maybe the time was coming that it might start to become unreliable just because it's had such hard years of use. And I like to replace my primary camera before that happens so I can use, it, use the old one as a, as a backup. And so the time came, had a couple of big assignments looming and I have a responsibility as a professional photographer to make sure that I've got reliable kit with me all the time. And so I decided that the mirrorless road was one that I wanted to look into. And I'm, you know, I'm interested in cameras as well. I'm interested in trying out new technology. Even if I've got something that does the job, I'm interested in trying out new stuff that might do it a little bit better. And there are a few things about this camera that I thought might make life better for me and might, you know, generate better output, better pictures for my clients, which ultimately is also my responsibility. So that's why I went down the road of buying it. Doesn't mean that I think that DSLRs are dead. I will be using my DSLR cameras alongside this for the foreseeable future. In fact, I still really like DSLR cameras. No, no um, animosity towards them whatsoever. Let's talk about the cost. So, you know, these things are expensive, but professional camera equipment has always been expensive. And when I look back over the last, good Lord, you know, three decades, when I bought my first EOS One film cameras, they were really expensive. Uh, Canon L lenses have, uh, have always been expensive, kind of in line with the same price as these, they've always been pricey. When I bought my first digital Canon camera, that was, that was expensive. When I bought my first full frame, digital camera from Canon, that was expensive too. And so roughly it's the same price, give or take a bit. But when you consider how many different things that this thing does, how many different hats it can wear, then it actually it starts to look like rather good value. But if you're looking at this from the perspective of somebody who, you know, maybe isn't making their living from photography, um, maybe somebody who's looking at the second hand market and thinking, what 
amazing value you can get for something that does nearly as good a job for a lot less money or a camera system that you know offers nearly as many functions or maybe even more functions but um you know maybe a smaller sensor but with different lenses you know for a lot less money then yeah you're completely right it, it, it is eye-wateringly expensive it's as simple as that and that's before you even start to talk about these little cf express cards which are really expensive and the card readers which are you know ridiculously expensive so on one hand it's <laughs> on one hand it's just the same as it's always been it's expensive professional camera equipment that gets the job done um on the other hand it's eye-wateringly expensive <laughs> you have to understand the nature of what it is that you're looking for in, in camera equipment, I guess, to, to answer that question for yourself. Okay, so let's talk about handling and battery life. Battery life, I've got three batteries. I've yet to flatten them all in one day shoot, but that's just shooting stills, not video, and I'm not really heavily into chimping. Um, I've come close to flattening all three in a day, and I do have a bag full of Canon 5D batteries in reserve, so I'm not too worried, but three is enough for me. Um, uh, in terms of the handling of the camera, I think it's kind of, this is, this is a classic yin and yang. So on one hand, it's brilliant. It's got all these buttons, all these controls, all of these dials all over it that you can customize to nearly everything. Not everything, but nearly everything. And that's amazing. This is a complicated beast. It's gonna take you time to get used to it. You're gonna have to read the instruction manual and you're gonna have to set it up for your specific use. It's taking me time to learn it. It's not the easiest thing in the world. There are a lot of complexities with this camera. And I, was picked, I picked up my Leica M9 the other day and it just felt like a breath of fresh air <laughs> coming from this because it just has one shutter control on the top, one aperture ring on the lens, and that's it pretty much. And everything else is kind of available. It's manual focus, it's kind of bog standard. Felt like a breath of fresh air because this, you do feel like it's kind of frustrating to get into the settings that you need. Although completely not frustrating because if you spend the time, you can have those controls anywhere that you like, which is amazing. Um, the lens has got three different, uh, <laughs> three different things to twiddle on it. Uh, a zoom, a focus and another ring that you can adjust to, you can make customizable to whatever you want. I've got mine set to aperture, but there's no markings for aperture. So you don't know what your aperture is. So you've got to look at the top. And I do not like this little screen on the top one bit. I think it's too small, not bright enough. And the digits are too small. There's this little button, which you can hold down for what feels like half a second too much to turn on the illumination and that is all cool. Apart from it doesn't really do quite enough. It feels like it still needs to be brighter and bigger and kind of clearer to see what you're doing. Beside this button, there is also this annoying record button, which is brilliant if you want to shoot video. At the, the drop of a hack, you can kind of just fire that button and it instantly starts shooting video. But it's annoying if you're just trying to turn your, your, your screen light on. So if you're an agile minded bright young thing you'll probably learn this like that no problem at all if you're a bit of a dinosaur like me a bit old a bit stuck in the past you might struggle with it a bit it might take you a while to map all of the buttons and controls but ultimately it's all there and the handling is kind of superb once you get over that barrier of complexity i'm not entirely sure i'll ever get over that barrel that that, that barrier of complexity to be perfectly honest and we'll talk about that more in the conclusion. I've got the grip, which is very good, um, does everything you want a grip to be. Expensive for a grip, but it's kind of cool. Okay, so let's talk about the sensor, ISO, frame rate, dynamic range, all of that kind of stuff. Just gonna touch on all of this for now. So this is a 45 megapixel sensor, which takes huge files. And that's very cool for two things. One, if you're gonna blow your work up huge to billboard size. I had some work used the other day as wall art for a client in a big office. And you know, when you're going up that big, every pixel counts, right? It's important. The other thing is that you can crop into these files. Now, a lot of people might ask, well, why surely you should be cropping in camera, you know, composing in camera, and you're completely right. Um, I always try and compose in camera and you know, hopefully don't have need to crop. But when you're working professionally for, let's say, the advertising world, sometimes you might take one frame that everyone can agree is the frame that they want to use for their campaign, but they might want to crop it three or four different ways, you know, a long skinny for a website or a panoramic for a billboard, or then an upright for something else for some other publication. And so the, 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 the confidence that having that much information in these files gives is really nice, really, really reassuring. However, if you don't do 
either of those things, blow up big or crop regularly, then you don't need 45 megapixels. I don't think you'll really see the difference alongside, you know, I shot it alongside my 5D Mark IV and day by day, you can't really see the difference. What is nice is when you crop into, when you, when you sort of zoom into 100% on the R5 files in the software afterwards, and you kind of think, oh, it might be a bit muzzy, and then it just kind of goes and just kind of pops that a little bit more, and you're just like, oh my god, look at that detail, it's really incredible. But day by day, side by side, you'd kind of struggle to see any difference alongside, you know, uh, a Canon 5D Mark IV or three file. And I bet if you blew the files up to sort of A3, maybe even A2, I doubt if anyone would be able to tell the difference. Um, in terms of the frame rate, this thing goes at 20 frames per second with the electronic shutter, which is way fast. I use it 12 frames per second maximum on the mechanical shutter, and that's fast enough for me. Fast enough, I've shot a lot of sport with it recently. More than fast enough. If you can't get it at 12 frames per second, you probably won't be able to get it at 20 frames per second, unless you're shooting something very, very, very specific. So more than fast enough. 45 megapixels at 12 frames per second. You know, holy smoke. ISO range, this thing goes up way, 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 way high. I've shot it way high. I shot some ice skating recently and I was just amazed at how well it could see in the dark. Um, I shot it 12,800, I think, for that assignment and it was just amazing. So more than enough for nearly every use. Now, I haven't tested it. I like to test ISO in the real world environment of where there is literally no light, but I absolutely have to come up with a picture. And this is done everything I've asked of it so far, but there will be a time that I really have to test it and I will come back to you and do a video on that. I don't like these kind of, you know, just testing ISO for the sake of testing ISO <laughs> videos. I don't think they work very well. Um, in terms of the dynamic range, it's as good as anything that Canon have had so far. The dynamic range is amazing. You can pull the shadows up and pull the highlights down and you can really pull that information out as much, at least as good as the 5D Mark IV. However, it's, the file is a little bit easier to break, I would say, than the previous Canon sensor files. So the 5D Mark IV files is kind of a bit more soft and malleable. This thing, there's an edge. You get to the edge and it's gone too far. And you need to be quite careful of that in lots of different ways, which makes me kind of think that the sensor is slightly different to everything that's gone before. But in terms of post-production and color, I'm gonna to come to that in a minute, it's not all the land of milk and honey because I couldn't get the colors out of this camera to begin with that I wanted and I'll come on to talk about that in a minute. So it's another day, let's talk about color. So I'm a raw shooter, I probably should look into using JPEG but, but I'm a bit old and a bit stuck in my ways, I like raw files. I also use Adobe Lightroom. Now it's quite well documented that uh, certainly to begin with, the Adobe and the Canon RAW files from these cameras didn't really play very nice together. They couldn't quite work out how to kind of um, get along quite so nice. So the colour wasn't that great. And I was a bit disappointed with it. It was a bit dark and a bit kind of dreary, a bit bleh, really. Um, and I've never thought that about a Canon camera before. I've always been quite happy with the Canon files, pretty much straight out of the camera, bit of post-production, done. Um, Canon colour science has always been great in my opinion. Not quite so with this. Now, people will say you should try using Canon DPP or Capture One Pro because you'll get better color from that with this sensor. And they may well or may well not be right, but I personally want to use Lightroom. It fits into my light, into my workflow. I use it every day in my professional workflow. I'm not ready to change. So, a little while after I got the camera, Adobe launched a thing called camera matching profiles within their software, which kind of helps a lot because you can smack that onto one of the raw files, all of them, if you like, on import. And it just kind of brings the colors back a little bit to where they should be. In addition to that, I have been working on my own profile, kind of low level um, preset, sorry, that I can just smack on all of the files and it just brings the color back to where I wish it to be and where I think it should be to my own preference. Quite gentle, nothing too dramatic, but just kind of working on the tones and the color, the contrast a little bit, and that really, really helps. And so that's kind of rectified my problem, I suppose, with the, co with the color. And I'm a bit disappointed that I had to go, to go down that road, to be perfectly honest, because I've never had that problem with any other Canon cameras. And you could probably go out and spend 250 quid on a Canon 5D Mark II, and it would probably have better, ca better color straight out of the 
straight off the bat than, 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 than this, in my opinion. Be interested to hear others' views about that. But that being said, there is loads of juice in these files, and so you can, you can create whichever colour to your heart's desire because there is so much depth in the file. So I'm a lazy photographer, I'm looking for the path of least resistance, but if you're willing to work with the nature of the camera and the nature of the RAW file and the nature of the, so the, the bit of software that you're using, you can get anything that you want and it is truly tremendous. And I'm probably being a little bit picky as well. I'm a bit of a perfectionist. Um, and especially after you've invested quite a lot of money in a camera, you kind of want it to be um, absolutely perfect in every way. And sometimes you just have to kind of slow down and work with the nature of the camera. Now there is something about the sensor in here that reminds me much more of Nikon or Sony or Panasonic colour than traditional Canon colour science. And I guess that's at the heart of my problem. Maybe by using different software I would get away from that, but I've found my solution, I guess. So I guess my point for this whole thing is to understand that you know you will have to work with this camera to get the most out of it, but there is a lot of juice in the files and you can achieve anything that your hearts desire if you're willing to understand the nature and to work with the camera. So the autofocus system on the R5 is awesome. It's probably the most important thing for me at the moment is making sure that when I shoot people that I'm getting absolutely sharp pictures and the R5 just delivers really well. I always knew it would. As soon as I tried it out for the first time, I thought it was a little bit of a kind of a renaissance moment in the world of autofocus. And um, for when shooting people, it's incredible. I shot about 800 pictures on a corporate portrait shoot the other day, all different types of lighting. Um, none of them were unsharp. Every single frame was perfect. And that's brilliant for me. I love it. But the system is complex. It's complicated. You have to tweak the settings. You have to kind of play around with it and change it for different purposes. It's quite important to do that actually, to get the best out of it. And there is one problem, and that is if you're shooting low contrast scenes like landscape or seascape photographs, then the system, the AF system really struggles to find anything and can go hunting around really thrown off. But you have to understand the nature of those kind of pictures and work with the system to make it work by either you know picking out an area of contrast or maybe even flipping to manual focus but if you're someone that does shoot lots of low contrast scenes then it's worth thinking about worth thinking about that's for sure okay so let's talk about the evf and the flippy screen both work really well um, i don't think that i've seen anything that works quite so well as the r5 so far it's super clean super clear super crisp refreshes really quickly and keeps up with the action if you get your settings right. It kind of does everything that you need it to. And the flippy screen is great as well because it can close off to give you kind of a hard back for when you're carrying your camera around. Or you can turn it around into normal mode or you can turn it to look low or you can turn it into selfie mode or you can turn it so that you can see down when you're, when you're holding the camera up high if that's what your wish is. And for me, I've spent most of my life lying in a ditch, taking pictures, looking up, because I like the low viewpoint. So I've spent a lot of my time with my head pressed into the corner of a gutter, looking up, composing my pictures. Now, the, the ability to be able to do that with, just by kind of pushing the camera down and looking into the screen, just extraordinary, love it, never get tired of that one. But I do wish that it had a screen that could flip on the axis with the lens rather than sticking out the side. And to demonstrate what I mean, I've got my Canon G7X, which is a compact camera, which has the ability to pull the screen out on the axis. So it's in line with the lens. So as you turn, everything kind of matches up, almost Rolleiflex, twin lens reflex style, Hasselblad. Um, but this comes out to the side, which to an old brain like mine, I find it a little bit difficult to kind of compensate that what I'm seeing here is going on through here, but probably people with more agile brains will be able to figure it out quicker than, than me. Um, now, I was playing with the Panasonic Lumix GH6 the other day, and they have nailed it. They've got a screen that does everything that this does, plus it flips on the axis. Ever since I knew that, I've been a little bit disappointed with this, I suppose, but for what it is, it does it really well. Um, the EVF, there are three things I'm not that happy about with it. And actually, I think they're more EVF specific than R5 specific, if you like. The, the, the first is that I've been getting EVF seasickness. I don't know if anyone else has experienced this. Maybe it's more to do with the in-body image stabilization, which is very good, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but after a long day shooting, I did a 10 hour shoot the other day. And by the end of that, I was wobbling around like a 
drunken sailor. I was just kind of crashing into things. And kind of, it was like I'd drunk half a bottle of red wine. So I, I, I suppose in some ways there is a, a positive to that. But um, I do find it quite tiring. It takes me a little while to reset. And I wonder if anyone else is experiencing EVF seasickness at all in any way, shape or form. Second thing I don't like is with flash. I'm not going to go down the wormhole of talking about flash with EVFs. It's quite complicated, but you have to kind of fiddle with your settings. And I use I use no flash, on camera flash, bounce flash, uh, studio flash, location flash, a whole variety of different lighting setups. And I found it a little bit complex to get it right. Um, but I'm learning to evolve with it, learning some shortcuts and some ways around dealing with that. So it is possible, but it does add a little bit of complexity. The third thing I don't like about the EVF is what I'm calling distancing. Um, when you photograph portraits with a tradi traditional optical viewfinder, you're actually looking in real life at the, the thing that you're photographing, the person that you're photographing, and you have a connection. So you can, be, you can be looking through the viewfinder, you can be talking to them, you can be interacting. Because when you look through one of these things, you're actually looking at a little television screen through a little hole. And I find that a little bit disconcerting. I find it that there's a little bit of disconnection that goes on. And also, I guess because you're using the EVF sometimes for fishing around in the menu, you can find yourself sort of wandering, almost kind of vaguely wandering off from the shoot, kind of looking through the through the EVF. And even when you're actually directly shooting, there can be a bit more distancing. I'm hoping to just kind of evolve out of that, I suppose, and that it's just a matter of progress. Like I said, I'm old, I'm a dinosaur. I'm kind of, it takes me a while to get used to this kind of stuff. Uh, but overall, the EVF and the flippy screens, as long as you understand the nature of them, you know, very cool. Okay, so let's talk about in-body image stabilization. It's just extraordinary. Does it really well. So there's, so there's a stabilization system within the camera itself, and then there's also the image stabilization on the lens. Now, I don't fully understand still exactly how it works, but it does work exceptionally well. It just throws all of the rule books, all the traditional rules out the window of what shutter speed you should be using. I was shooting the other night down to a quarter of a second and still getting sharp pictures with a bit of care. It's extraordinary. However, it doesn't take uh, consideration of the fact that you might have subject movement. So if you're photographing a person, they might well be moving. So while it does break all the rules, you still need to kind of be aware of those if there's subjects in your pictures. Now, let's talk about the lenses. So I've bought a couple of different lenses to go with this camera so far. I haven't, haven't kind of invested in the whole range just yet. And they've both, I've got the 24 to 105 and the 14 to 35, and they are both extraordinary, exceptionally sharp throughout. No, you know, technically perfect, technically brilliant. Controls are great too. Um, everything sort of falls pretty much where you want it to be in your hand. The extra control ring is very cool. No zoom creep on the 24 to 105, which is great. Love that. Um, and they are just great, you know, no problem at all so far. There are a couple of issues I have with them. Um, one is that they're a little bit chunkier, they're a little bit chunky monkey. <laughs> and also they don't have, or well, they have it, but it's very small. The old EF lenses used to have this great big red blob on the side, which was great at night or in difficult lighting circumstances. You see the red blob and you could just kind of know exactly where you needed to be. Whereas these lenses are slightly less, Fe they're slightly featureless, I suppose. So it's a bit harder to change lenses at night. I've struggled a few times with it. Uh, but you know, these are things that I will just get used to. Um, also the build quality of them, I don't know, just doesn't kind of feel quite as good as maybe the EF lenses, but time will tell. You know, this thing is 25 years old and still works perfectly. I wonder if um, I wonder how these lenses will be in 25 years time. Um, we'll see, won't we? Just because something doesn't feel good build quality doesn't necessarily mean that it is. So I'm, you know, only time will tell. So far they've been fine. Okay, so let's talk about the adapter. So I'm still using some of my EF lenses with this. I'm sort of halfway. So in many ways, I'm the problem rather than the system. But I think lots of other people will probably be halfway or changing slowly over. And the adapter works brilliantly, by the way. It just kind of snaps onto the back of your old EF lenses and it just kind of works exceed, exceedingly well. It breathes new life into a lot of these lenses because the AF system is a little bit better. It just kind of brings new sharpness to old lenses. Great, really, really cool. One negative, I suppose, is that it makes the lenses bigger. That's the nature of an adapter. You know, you can't have it any other way. 
There are a couple of different adapters. I've just got the basic one. And it does kind of make them a little bit bigger and a little bit more off balance and a bit bigger in your, in your bag, I suppose, depending on how you work it. Now, one of the problems I have is that I'm trying to use, I typically use a two camera system, but I've only got one R body. So I'm then using my 5D Mark IV or whichever other one of my DSLRs. And it does present me with a problem. So when I was traveling the other day, you kind of need to be able to have a backup of everything, right? Um, so I use two cameras, but I also carry two cameras because it forms a, its own backup system. Now, for example, um, this 24 to 105 won't fit onto this body. So if my R5 went wrong and I needed a 24 to 105, it won't be able to put it on my DSLR body. So I need to carry a 24 to 105 for the old DSLR cameras as well, which means I'm ending up doubling up with everything that I'm carrying. I'm kind of in that midway change point, but it's a bit of a pain. Um, let me know if you've found any solutions other than me going out and spending thousands more pounds on RF lenses or ditching this and going back completely to the DSLR line. Who knows? It's okay. I'm working with it at the moment. What I typically do is bring just enough lenses to cover me for everything. And that's no big deal. It's a pain if you're flying. Um, there we go. Um, one thing that I will talk about very quickly with the um, RF lenses and I don't know if it's because I only have used these two kind of pretty bog standard zooms. They're technically perfect, but I'm struggling to see any character in either of them. And um, I think maybe if I use some of the RF primes, I might be a bit more kind of, um, might find a bit more character. But uh, yeah, a little bit of a problem for me that I struggle to love the pictures that come out of them, I suppose. But is that just typical of a 24 to 105 mil zoom lens? I think it is probably. So here we are in conclusion. And I brought my Leica M9 along to join the party, a camera that I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with. And what a camera the R5 is. You know, it's just the most extraordinary photography tool, capable of taking hugely high resolution pictures, repeatedly sharp under almost any circumstances, tracking the eye of a zebra running towards you if you wish it to, um, and, and anything else, it will just do it really, really well and deliver repeatedly super sharp, high resolution pictures. Just an extraordinary photography tool, a, a real camera for the next generation. And that's not even talking or even touching on its video capabilities, which also are pretty impressive, very impressive. But with that, there comes this level of complexity. The menus are complex, the controls are complex, learning to use it is a little bit more complicated than I would like. Maybe this says more about me, maybe I really am a dinosaur. I am a dinosaur. But when I pick up a camera like the Leica M9, it just feels so simple. Just shutter on the top, aperture, focus, that's it. And in many ways, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, controls in here actually, whereas they're supposed to ease the path, they actually kind of, make the path to good old-fashioned simple photography a little bit more complicated. But having said that, half the pictures I take on my M9 are pretty much always out of focus and there's all kinds of things that you can't shoot with it. So it's kind of a bit ridiculous to compare them. You know, this thing walks all over the M9 in so many different ways as a professional tool and I would choose it every day of the week if I had to deliver pictures for a client, that's for sure. So for me, I'm just going to learn to evolve to love this thing a little bit more, learn to uh, use it a little bit easier, learn to kind of create a bionic connection with it and go on to use it to make many hundreds of successful pictures, which at the end of the day is what it's all about. Really, the cameras aren't that important. The pictures are, are what matters. And if I can't take the pictures that I wanna be shooting or need to shoot with this, then it's on me. It's my responsibility as a photographer. Um, thank you for joining me on my journey down the road to mirrorless, my journey on the on the path of changing camera systems. I hope there's been something here of interest to you. Thank you very much for your support, for watching. Uh, goodbye. <laughs>